The survival of Britain as a free, democratic, self-governing, sovereign state is again under threat. This time it comes from a European elite that is determined to destroy the nations of Europe and replace them with a centralized corporate superstate, the United States of Europe. This would impose a written constitution on Britain and we would be forced to surrender major and vital powers to Brussels. We would no longer be able to run our own economy nor defend ourselves without the EU say so. Control of our own foreign affairs and social policies would pass to Brussels as well. The European Union would take for itself the right to interfere in every nook and cranny of our national life, even more than it does already. If we are to retain the ability to govern ourselves through a parliament and government which we not only elect but can also dismiss, then the British people must fight this attempt to take over our country completely. We won the Battle of Britain in 1940. We now have a new battle on our hands, just as real and just as dangerous. This is the battle for Britain. The film you are about to see explains the facts and why it is vital for you to join in this battle. Your country needs you, now. In the summer of 2004, Britain, as an independent country, will disappear, and the British, as a self-governing free people, will cease to exist. Is that what we want? In 1972, Edward Heath signed the Treaty of Rome and took Britain into the common market. The way in which that event was presented to the British people established a pattern of political deceit that has been maintained to this day. The 1971 Foreign and Commonwealth Office document entitled sovereignty in the European communities, warned that joining the common market meant essential aspects of sovereignty would increasingly be transferred to the community itself. But nobody told the British people. Throughout its closely typed pages, the document emphasises time and time again that loss of sovereignty will increase as the community develops. But nobody told the British people. Sovereignty means the freedom of a people to govern themselves and be independent of outside control. The 1971 document warned that the British would lose that freedom and ultimately be governed from Brussels. But nobody told the British people. The 1971 document was to be suppressed for 30 years. Sir Crispin Tickle, one of Heath's negotiators, admitted in 2001 that in respect of the loss of sovereignty issues, it was decided the less they came out in the open, the better. This despite a 1972 briefing from the law lords during which Lord Wilberforce told Heath that the Treaty of Rome and subsequent European law meant a total loss of sovereignty. And how did Edward Heath deal with this momentous constitutional change? Quite simply, he said it wasn't happening. In a white paper to Parliament and the accompanying pamphlet, he wrote, there is no question of Britain losing essential national sovereignty. An intentionally misleading impression was fostered of a trading agreement, a level playing field with continental Europe. The fact that Britain was being signed up to an economic and political structure that would eventually mean the destruction of our national parliament was deliberately concealed. In 1975, the Labour Prime Minister Harold Wilson held a referendum on whether Britain should remain in the common market. Prior to the referendum, Wilson produced a pamphlet in which he identified the possibility of a single currency and promised, this threat has been removed. Like Heath before him, Wilson deceived us. He knew that by signing the Treaty of Rome and other written assurances our politicians had already given, Britain had been committed to membership of the Euro. Wilson also wrote, the minister representing Britain can veto any proposal for a new law or new tax if he considers it to be against British interests. Another lie. A passage in the 1971 document points out that decisions would either require majority voting or consensus. Conservative, Labour and Liberal Democrat politicians have systematically deceived us all about the European Union. The method they employ is simple. Whenever a potentially significant EU policy is imminent, they first deny that it will happen. They later admit that it will happen, but it won't apply to Britain. Later still, they admit it does apply to Britain, but that it's not important. Eventually, they admit that it is important, but now it's inevitable anyway. That 1971 document offered further advice 
on how best to hide what was happening. Her Majesty's government and all political parties, it advised, should not exacerbate public concern by attributing unpopular measures or unfavourable economic developments to the remote and unmanageable workings of the community. In other words, the growing influence of Brussels must be hidden and EU policies presented as homegrown national initiatives. This duplicity continues to this day. Here are just a few examples. Our own government has been encouraging a switch from analogue to digital TV. It has hidden the fact that this hugely expensive changeover is an EU-wide plan to free up analogue frequencies so that they can be sold. The government's insistence on the involvement of private funding to run the London Tube Service is to keep within the public borrowing limits of the European Union's Stability and Growth Pact. The changes to the Royal Mail, apparently being made under UK legislation, are, in reality, in compliance with the EU Directive 9767, opening up postal services to increased competition and in anticipation of further EU measures. 50,000 British postal jobs are now threatened and rural post offices are closing. Virtually every change in our lives is due to laws from Brussels, but our own politicians continue to hide this from us. Perhaps the most cynical misrepresentation of EU policy is the so-called devolution process. In May 2002, John Prescott announced his 30-year dream of eight devolved English governmental regions, in line with the alleged devolution in Scotland, Northern Ireland, 